Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second episode at, of uh, Stay at Home, our new YouTube series. I'm at home, and as you can tell, I have nothing on the wall. I'm just a lot of uh, a, a lot of sitting around, a lot of reading, a lot of working on Jacobin, a lot of uh, talking to myself. So I'm so glad that now, today, I get to talk to Nicole Ashoff, who is the uh, editor-at-large of Jacobin. Uh, she writes a couple times a week on the Jackman website. Uh, she's uh, the author previously of New Profits of Capital, a book that was in the Verso Jacobin series. And she's the author of the newly released uh, Smartphone Society, Technology, Power, and Resistance in the New Gilded Age. Um, so obviously, just to recap what we're doing um, here uh, with the Stay at Home series, we are gonna host uh, talks um, almost every single day. Uh, we're gonna take most Sundays off, but generally Monday through Saturday at 6 p.m. Uh, we're gonna invite a left-wing thinker to give a talk about a subject, and there's a you know, eclectic variety of stuff uh, lined up. Uh, yesterday, we had a really timely talk with Mike Davis on the politics of the coronavirus crisis and what comes next. And there was a discussion afterwards, a lot of Q&A was focused on strategy. Um, today, Nicole is going to talk about uh, the uh, recent uh, coronavirus uh, relief bill that passed the Senate and uh, about the past history of, of corporate bailouts like the uh, 2009 auto uh, bailout and how socialists should relate to these things. And there's obviously some tricky questions that come up in part because we um, you know, are reliant on having profitable uh, private companies to be sources of employment and also for to be um, uh, you know, sources of, of tax revenue for the state. On the other hand, we know the way these bills are built are almost entirely just made to benefit uh, a tiny part of the corporate elite and not uh, working, working people. So Nicole's gonna dive into that. And tomorrow at 6 p.m., we are making Ronan Burtnishaw, the editor of the UK-based Tribune, uh, stay up late and join us for a, a lecture, a kind of history of the creation of the National Health Service in the UK, one of the greatest you know, working class achievements of the past uh, century. And um, what, where the NS NHS is now uh, and what lessons some of that struggle has for, for our push here in the United States uh, for something not quite as ambitious as a National Health Service, but a uh, Medicare for all single payer um, system. Uh, well, um, in any case, uh, now I guess I'll turn it off to uh, over to Nicole for the next uh, 25 or so minutes. But um, obviously we are taking questions from you. So if you have questions during the broadcast, uh, just uh, put them in the you know comments field. I will uh, read questions. I'll read the mediocre ones. I'll read the good ones. Might even read a couple bad ones. So please, you know, there are no bad questions. Put the questions in the uh, in the, the field. And uh, I will uh, be back on to uh, facilitate that Q&A when Nicole's done in like 25 minutes. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Bhaskar. Just want to, I hope everyone out there is staying safe and sane. Uh, I just wanted to express my gratitude and solidarity for all of the frontline workers, nurses, doctors, uh, childcare providers, delivery drivers, all the people out there who are actually uh, on the front lines, making sure people get the help and supplies that they need. And so I just wanted to say, you know, thank you to all of you. And, you know, I'm one of the people that's kind of sitting in my house uh, with my kids and my mother-in-law and my husband, uh, just trying to, you know, keep going with what we're doing and work from home. And this kind of strange dynamic where there's a few, you know, there's a bunch of vulnerable workers out there and the rest of us are inside has created this kind of unprecedented crisis. Uh, as many of you might have seen, last week there were a record 3.3 billion claims for unemployment and and this is this is really unprecedented i mean we we saw us uh it's reminiscent of a surge that we saw in the early 1980s with the volcker shock but this is really something that we haven't experienced um before and so 
This is why Congress has been scrambling over the past week uh, to pass the stimulus bill when it finally went through um, and got signed by the president uh, just this afternoon. So what I'd like to do tonight is just kind of dig into that a little bit, um, but also to provide some context uh, comparing this bailout with the 2008 uh, crisis and bailout. And also if we have time to, you know, think about where we should be pushing and where we should be moving forward. So I think it's worth saying uh, just at the start um, that there are actually uh, some pretty positive things that have, have come out of this stimulus bill. Um, and these things are really, I think it's important to emphasize, these are not, um, you know, they're, they're qualified goods, I would say, um, but they're, they're things that are a result of a lot of the kind of push by progressives over the past decade who have learned the lessons from the 2008 crisis and who have really seen uh, the way the economy is growing, the skyrocketing inequality that we're witnessing in the United States, and, and really trying to push the narrative in a direction that puts people uh, before profit. So I think we have to remember that some of the good things that are coming out of this bill are really a result of, of this kind of push and that we should uh, take this as an example uh, and evidence that we need to push uh, even even harder going forward. So what are some of the good things that we're seeing uh, coming out of this bill? Well, the first thing um, is that we actually are seeing this big um, bump, right? The, the, the federal government is going to uh, supplement this state unemployment insurance by giving uh, people an extra $600 a week, uh, extending the length of time that they can get uh, this unemployment insurance and really trying to make people whole again. One of the interesting things about uh, this shift in the unemployment strategy uh, is that traditionally unemployment uh, has been uh, stingy on purpose uh, as a way to sort of get people out to find a job, any job, no matter if it pays less than their previous job. And what we're seeing right now actually is that the federal government is, is actually trying to uh, make it possible for people to stay at home uh, so that they're not actually spreading this virus, getting themselves and others sick. Another interesting thing about unemployment is that for the first time, Congress and the federal government are basically recognizing that app workers uh, and freelancers and you know members of the gig economy, as it's called, are crucial uh, are a crucial part of the US economy and deserve to be recognized. So we're actually seeing them included in, in some of these benefits. And this is really important um, moving forward. And it's really you know, a sign that we actually need to, to push in this, in this direction, right? To say, all right, we're recognizing that these people are a really important part of our economy. Now it's time for companies like Uber uh, and Lyft to actually treat uh, these people as employees and to pay their fair share, uh, including uh, in terms of social security taxes and, and unemployment taxes. So that's something to think about. Um, another good thing that we're seeing uh, is actually this kind of one-time payment. I say this is this is a qualified good thing in the sense that uh, you know it's better than nothing. Um, but certainly, if we think about um, you know the fact that a majority of American households actually doesn't have enough savings to uh, pay one month of expenses, uh, we start to see what kind of desperate straits people are in. So we see the necessity of this, you know, up to $1,200 per person, but also just how much uh, this is This is something that we're gonna have to, to build on it and give people more support, right? People are desperately in need of this. Um, another thing that I think has some good uh, elements is this um, $377 billion that's being allocated for small businesses. Uh, the good thing about this is actually um, that these businesses, if they take loans from the federal government, will be able to treat the loans that they use to pay wages, uh, to pay their mortgages, to pay utilities, to keep the business going, uh, and to keep 90% of their employees on the payroll, that they'll be able to write these off later uh, as grants. And I think that this is really important. Uh, there's also the interesting kind of, uh, you know, part of this uh, part of the bill 
where basically there's language uh, saying that these small businesses also have to remain neutral uh, if workers choose to uh, try to form a union. I think this is nice. I'm not sure this is um, actually enforceable, uh, but certainly it's at least uh, supportive of the of the rights and the need for for workers to uh, actually organize and 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 make sure uh, you know to actually sort of develop uh, a movement to try to to try to get a, a living wage. Um, I think that this 377 billion dollars is insufficient if you consider the fact that only about 17 percent of jobs in the United States are at S&P 500 companies. Most of them are at smaller companies. Uh, I think it's important uh, that, that small businesses actually get um, quite a bit more support uh, just in terms of maintaining jobs. But I think that this is a good start. Um, all right, so I think that those things, um, you know, those elements of the bill are fairly positive and definitely uh, an improvement from, from what we saw in 2008, which I'll talk a little bit more about um, in a few minutes, but I think it's also worth, um, you know, being a bit critical. I know that you know we're in this kind of moment where we feel like we have to pass a stimulus bill. We don't have time to think about, uh, you know, what the long-term implications of the bill might be. People need help right now. Uh, that's true, but I think we also um, need to be critical of what's in this bill because. I have little doubt that in the next month uh, and in the next few months, there will be, uh, you know, more conversations. We'll probably need at least one more stimulus bill. Uh, and so it's important to really make clear what's missing from the bill and what we need uh, to correct and try to push for moving forward. So I think one of the most obvious problems with the bill, if we're thinking about um, the support that um, families are getting from this uh, boosted unemployment insurance is that there are millions of Americans, undocumented Americans, who despite paying taxes uh, are not eligible for these benefits, right? And, uh, and particularly we're seeing, you know, if you think about undocumented workers in the United States, they make up um, at least 10% of jobs in sectors um, like, you know, hotel services, the restaurant industry, these families are in big trouble right now, and they're not going to benefit from this bill. So I think this is something that we have to take uh, really seriously. And if we're, you know, if there's a possibility of another stimulus bill, we really need to push um, for for these uh, individuals to to get some help that they need. Uh, if we think about some other elements of the bill that are lacking. Um, Certainly, if we're, if we're thinking about the relief that's going both to, to state and local governments and also to hospitals, all right, so I think it's about $150, $150 billion is earmarked for state and local governments and another $100 billion uh, is going to go to hospitals who are fighting uh, the coronavirus. This to me seems wildly insufficient uh, for a few reasons. Um, one is just the basic reason that um, the majority of cities say they are completely out of supplies. They don't have the things they need to actually keep either their healthcare workers safe uh, or the patients, right? People who are getting sick. Uh, we have, uh, you know, such a shortage of supplies and beds um, that people are being told to stay at home uh, and try to recuperate at home, which is um, not a recipe for actually containing this virus because you then everyone in the household gets sick uh, and people are not able to get the care that they need. But if we think about this, the, con the, the context, this crisis, right, this coronavirus crisis, if we think about this in the context of our healthcare system in this country, which is optimized for profit, not for actually providing people um, with the care they need to get better, uh, and also is designed, uh, you know, on an employer-based model. Uh, we have a real crisis brewing here. You know, we have this huge spike in uh, people filing unemployment claims. That means all of those people, if they uh, got their health care from their employer, no longer have health care, right? So we're in this crisis where people are desperately sick. Uh, they need to be able to get health care, yet they have no insurance. Right? They aren't actually able to um, 
to go to the hospital because they're afraid that they won't be able to pay their bill. And we're already seeing um, examples of huge healthcare bills uh, being associated uh, with the, this virus. So people are really afraid uh, actually to even seek the care they need and that care is not even uh, available because the supplies and the staff and the beds are not available. So this is a huge crisis, uh, even in the immediate sense. But we can also think about you know, the, the, the longer term environment that we find ourselves in that uh, l has left us so unprepared for this crisis. And this is partly a result of the, the sort of misappropriation of funds. And we can think about this in terms of the cuts to the CDC that we've seen over the past uh, decade, but also uh, just the, the, um, the misappropriation of funds in terms of just funding basic research, right? on uh, you know, viruses, right? We're spending so much money funding our military, for example, rather than spending money on basic science that really would have put us in a better position to um, really understand and grasp the danger of this virus and also to uh, have developed um, you know, some actual vaccines uh, and strategies to fight it, right? So we see this huge uh, crisis uh, in healthcare at many different scales. And this is something that's gonna really require uh, a lot more funding. Now, you know, you could say, well, where is all this money going to come from to actually, you know, provide healthcare for everyone? Even something as simple as saying, anyone who visits the doctor uh, or the hospital over the next year should not get a bill, right? At the most basic level, you could say, well, where is this money going to come from? Well, if we look at the bill, we see um, that uh, lawmakers and, and policymakers, uh, certainly pushed uh, by Wall Street, have managed to find uh, themselves $500 billion, uh, which the Fed promises to leverage into trillions of dollars as this kind of slush fund, um, you know, to to bail out Wall Street. And here, I think, you know, we're really we're really seeing kind of a 2008 redux. And, you know, so I think it's worth actually thinking about this for for a couple of minutes. Um, you know, in in 2008, you know, it's it's not the same crisis, obviously. This is the, not the same type of crisis that we saw in 2008, but some elements are similar. In a very basic sense, uh, in 2008, we saw uh, we had a huge spiraling economic crisis. Uh, the global economy was sort of on the, on the precipice of meltdown, uh, and Congress um, handed the Treasury uh, and the Federal Reserve billions, hundreds of billions of dollars with the express order to bail out homeowners and to get banks uh, lending again, right? These were, this was the directive. Uh, but what we actually saw during this uh, crisis was that that did not happen. Uh, millions of people were evicted. And instead of getting, uh, you know, lending going again, what we saw with uh, banks, right? both through the TARP bailout, but also through other bailouts and, and secret uh, loans worth trillions of dollars uh, over a number of years, is that banks used that money not to lend to small businesses uh, or to people, but actually just to strengthen their balance sheets, uh, to make uh, mergers, uh, to engage in all kinds of profit-making strategies that actually made the, these banks that survived the crisis even bigger. Um, and they made a lot of money. Now, when we think about all right, what the impact of the 2008 bailout was on ordinary people, uh, it was really bad. And so one of the things that I've uh, talked about and studied um, just as an example of this uh, is, is the way that the, the auto industry was restructured um, during uh, 2008 and 2009. And here's just a sort of, the auto industry is, is useful as just kind of a, a, a microcosm of the, of the way the 2008 bailout was designed to really benefit elites uh, and to, uh, you know, kind of say to ordinary people that you are dispensable, right? Your needs can be sacrificed for the greater good of, you know, the global economy or the national economy. So what we saw in the, in the United in, in in the auto industry in 2009 uh, was that the, the the Federal Reserve and the Treasury agreed uh, to a bailout 
package and a restructuring of Chrysler and General Motors that basically destroyed three decades of gains of auto workers, uh, closed down dozens of plants, uh, and really destroyed the livelihoods of, of dozens of communities in the United States that relied on these jobs. Uh, the, uh, the auto companies uh, quickly returned to profitability and, uh, and actually experienced very high levels of profit um, while you saw decades of gains wiped out. And this is a real, people say, well, you know, that was then and, and we had to do it, but it's important to look at what the kind of long-term implications of, of, the, of the ways that we uh, work through crises are, right? We have a decade to look back at the 2008 bailout uh, and really learn some lessons. But I fear, you know, in this stimulus package, the one that just passed, right? Again, we're, we're, we're earmarking hundreds of billions of dollars uh, for companies um, and it's not really clear sort of what the, what the directive is to make sure that there are actual, you know, strings attached, there are actual conditions uh, to, to use this money to actually, um, to actually help, you know, get the economy going again, right? We're, we're rewarding companies that over the past decade have spent money on share buybacks you know, they spend their profits on share buybacks much more than they're actually, uh, you know, spending money on brick and mortar investment uh, or, or, you know, creating jobs in communities. And we're, we, we're sort of finding ourselves repeating this pattern. Now, you know, it's, there's this, it's slightly better in the sense that, uh, you know, Steve Mnuchin is not going to, you know, secretly be able to allocate whatever money he wants. They will have to uh, actually appoint a special inspector general. But, and I encourage everyone to read Neil Borofsky's book, Bailout, who was the spe special inspector general uh, for TARP. Uh, and if you read his book, you really show that, uh, you really can see, sorry, that his role was quite limited, right? Uh, what he, what that book really shows, and, and people should really read it, uh, is that you know the Treasury and the Federal Reserve basically did whatever they wanted with money, uh, with these hundreds of billions and ultimately trillions of dollars, uh, and, and and didn't actually use that money uh, to 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 benefit ordinary people. So I fear that we're in this a similar kind of situation. Uh, again, so you know, as we're thinking about moving forward, right? What should we be asking for, right? What what should we be saying uh, so that we're not we don't find ourselves in the same situation that we did uh, in 2008? I think there are a few things, um, questions that we should be asking, and 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 by extension, demands, right? The first is um, a very simple demand, which is that the frontline workers who are uh, dealing with this crisis, right? Whether they are people who work in uh, elderly homes, they're nurses, they're doctors, they're delivery drivers, they're warehouse workers. Um, these people should be our top priority and we should, we should be demanding money to, to make sure that these people are safe and that they have a living wage and that they have uh, health care uh, and that they have an opportunity to unionize and improve their workplaces. But if we're thinking, you know, a bit more broadly, right, moving forward, if, if, if the federal government, right, whether it's the treasury or we're talking about the Federal Reserve, uh, is ready to give companies billions, possibly trillions of dollars, we really need to ask ourselves, uh, who's going to benefit from this, right? And if we're willing to bail out uh, these, these companies, we should be demanding that we get something in return. Now, in the language of the of, of the stimulus bill, there is the potential uh, that you know, the US government can purchase some equities, uh, but these are non-voting shares, right? Instead of this, we can say, look, and this is something, if you think about a venture capitalist, right? They would never dump billions of dollars into a company uh, in exchange for no voting rights or no equity. So I don't know why we uh, are expected to do the same thing, right? If we're thinking about socializing ownership, right? To actually, uh, reframe the directives of companies so that they're that they're you know designed around the needs of workers and communities well this is a situation where we can say yes we'll give you the money that you need but you actually have to give us something in return which is some some control 
uh, over you know the, the biggest the biggest uh, companies in the United States. And second, if we're thinking broadly moving forward, instead of just relying on these you know tools of, of monetary policy and, and endless quantitative easing uh, and you know uh, you know Fed engineered low interest rates, which really have created an incredibly fragile economy. Right, we see this within two weeks. Um, our economy is on its knees. This is partly the re result of the virus, but it's also a result of the types of, you know, policy tools that we've relied on for the past decade that have created an extremely leveraged economy uh, that is geared toward the profit-making needs of a few, you know, corporate executives, corporations, and uh, billionaires. If we're thinking about how do we actually build a stronger economy moving forward, we have to start talking about, you know, terms that have become uh you know that went out of fashion right but are now we're talking about again like ideas about industrial policy all right if we're thinking about building a stronger economy we have to we have to start thinking about more creative ways of using fiscal policy to actually create jobs uh in a in a, in a, a more lasting way and this can be something as simple as you know passing medicare for all right so we can actually create a healthier population where people aren't succumbing to the disease not just because uh you know they don't have the immediate care but because they're 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 poor and they have all of these pre-existing conditions because they're never able to access preventative care you know if we think about moving forward right one of the main lessons that we have to learn from the 2008 crisis is that we can't just repeat the same types of mistakes and policy tools uh, you know, and, and, and adopt the same flawed policy tools that we did then. So I think this stimulus bill is a little bit better, uh, but certainly as we're moving forward, we need to push uh, for, for something that's, that's a lot better. All right, well, uh, thanks a lot for that, um, Nicole. And uh, just for people who are tuning in a little bit uh, late, uh, we are doing these um, talks almost every day um, uh, at 6 p.m. Eastern, uh, most days. And we have a left-wing thinker to talk about an issue. Then we have a brief Q&A afterwards. Uh, today, we have Nicole Ashoff, who is the um, uh, editor-at-large of Jacobin. And she writes a column a couple times a week for Jacobin. She's also uh, the author, most recently, of the Smartphone Society, Technology, Power, and Resistance in the New Gilded Age. Uh, she was supposed to have an event, uh, a launch event, a couple weeks ago, which unfortunately uh, was, was canceled. So please do check out her, uh, her, her book, and hopefully this, in some part, um, you know, is, is, is a, um, a promotional event. Uh, too. So uh, we are taking questions in the YouTube comments if you want to drop drop a line. A couple of people also emailed me. Um, one of these uh, questions is probably worth asking that, that I got emailed, but in general, just drop it in YouTube, um, you know, instead. And again, by the way, tomorrow we're going to have uh, Ronan Burtonshaw from the UK uh, publication, our sister publication, Tribune, will be talking about the origins of the national uh, health service. Um, so to start with, just the question that I was um, emailed um, was by Jeff. I guess I shouldn't say last name. I don't know. People people want want uh, it as public information that they spend their evenings uh, listening <laughs> to left-wing video casts. Um, but email just, I guess, for your general thoughts on UBI and the fact that it seemed like UBI um, was briefly on the agenda. I'm not sure how much it was ever on the agenda, but Mitt Romney said, give some people some money. And some other people like Bernie Sanders said, why not give them money every month? And it seemed like that was a potential solution in part because our uh, welfare state in the U.S. is so shattered that it's you know hard to actually deliver people. It's hard to even figure out mechanisms to actually give people the services and goods that they, they need to survive. So I guess, uh, Nicole, to start with your general thoughts on, on UBI and whether its relevance became increased during this, this crisis and its future prospects and your own personal thoughts, I guess. Too. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I think a lot of people are thinking about UBI, particularly as we imagine a future where more and more of us are periodically uh, quarantined in our homes uh, or separated from work or, or constantly you know, moving from job to job. But my, my feelings about UBI are that it has a limited value. Um, I think that if we're thinking about people like uh, students or uh, elderly people or uh, people with, who, who um, are unable to work for a, a variety of reasons, uh, you know, those people I think would benefit from UBI. And I think that's something that we should definitely include uh, in, in a future kind of, you know, public sa safety net. But if we're thinking about uh, UBI as a strategy for the country as a whole, I think that uh, a job guarantee would be a much better strategy. Uh, and, and there are a few reasons why. I think one, um, you know, and, and people can say whether this is, is good or bad, but I think work really uh, gives people meaning uh, and, it, and it allows them to, you know, have creativity and be part of their community uh, and it's a core part of their identity. So I think work is really important and just access to work um, and access to a good job is, is, is a key part of, you know, being you know, a participant, uh, an active participant in society. And I think a job guarantee is something that uh, we could easily um, provide in the United States. Uh, and also because there is a, is a lot of work to be done, right? And we can think about um, a lot of the projects that we want to develop moving forward. Um, you know, whether it's the Green New Deal or, you know, uh, a, a just transition that involves rebuilding our infrastructure. Um, you know, these are things that require people to participate in them. And so I think actually making meaningful work on these projects could really, you know, develop both a set of people's personal identity, but also, you know, make them feel like they're, they're part of their community and society. So uh, Ashkan has a question about, uh, you know, can you speak more about how socialists should prepare for an expected second stimulus package and actually first he wrote bailout and then he corrected himself and said stimulus <laughs> and this is funny because i got a i got a, another uh a text message from a, a friend of mine who's tuning in but i guess doesn't want to log on to youtube who's uh of a more libertarian bent and not the good you know spanish anarchist you know barcelona libertarian the bad libertarian um who who you know had a similar question which was you know uh, so first, there's that tactical, serious question that we should take seriously uh, about what we should do to prepare for this second stimulus package. But the other related kind of question that came to mind was, oh, I guess bailout implies that these companies did something wrong, the financial banks did something wrong. A very common argument now is that these companies getting bailed out didn't do anything wrong. I think you already kind of touched on what they did wrong, which was not leaving any stock, any reserves left uh, in these companies' coffers because they were just giving them away with, with buybacks and with, with um, dividends and with ex executive compensation. Uh, but I don't know. I think that that's a good enough reason to call it a bailout, I think. Uh, but Ashkin's question was more of a um, strategic question, you know, how we should prepare for, for a second stimulus package. And I guess related to that, embedded in it, uh, do you think there's going to be a second uh, package? I mean, my thinking is that there, there will need to be a second package. Uh, simply some of the reasons that I talked about, the money that we're giving hospitals, for example, and, and state and local governments is not nearly enough to tackle uh, what's coming, right? We haven't even seen the tidal, the tidal wave of cases uh, uh, yet in this country. And I think it's something scary. And I think we need a lot more resources to tackle that. You know, if we're thinking about what we should be demanding, uh, moving forward. Well, the reason why I, I was making the comparisons to the 2008 crisis is not because I'm saying, oh, it's the same thing, but to say we made some real mistakes during that crisis and now is the time when we need to fix, uh, fix those mistakes and not let them happen again. So moving forward, right, we need to in the most basic sense, right, demand uh, that everyone is protected in terms of unemployment insurance, right? So undocumented uh, Americans who are really vulnerable right now, uh, you know, 
people who are homeless, people who fall through the cracks, right? This 3.3 million number really underestimates the number of Americans who are in pain right now, right? Whether it's financial pain or actually just fear about, uh, you know, their, their health and safety of themselves and their loved ones. So we really need to make sure that we're capturing in this kind of, you know, uh, making people whole idea, we're, we're capturing really a, a lot more people. And we're going to have to demand a lot more money for, for hospitals and, and actual care, right? Like people have to be able to get care without uh, going bankrupt right now more than ever. But also learning these lessons from 2008, we really need to uh, get loud uh, and, and about this you know, slush fund. Because what happened in 2008 was you had this initial TARP fund, which was, you know, several hundred billion dollars. But then what you had uh, behind the scenes was trillions more dollars handed out to banks and big corporations that no one even knew about until years later. So we need to prevent that from happening again because there's a very good chance, you know, we have the, the, the Treasury Secretary is once again uh, from Goldman Sachs, right? And we have a lot of the same types of people and ideas spurring this kind of bailout. So we really need to make sure that uh, we're not repeating those mistakes. And that's really where the left should be intervening, right? So another question that, that came in, uh, and I've, I've heard a lot in the last week was, um, I guess this general use of the rhetoric of general strike uh, and other kind of strike revenue uh, rhetoric in this, in this uh, circumstance. So, um, one, does it make sense for socialists to agitate for something like that? Should we use this language kind of before we have the capability to, um, you know, actually go on go on strike in mass? Uh, is it is it useful, in other words, to um, to use this language to have it on the horizon? Uh, do you think there's tactical value there? Um, you know, so I guess on the question of a general strike. I think at this point, the general strike as an imaginary could be useful in the sense that uh, people can, you know, remind themselves uh, of, of their importance and their strategic position in the economy. And, you know, but sort of, all right, what do we do for the next six months? What do we do for the next year? I think that the question of strike uh, striking has to be something that's a bit more targeted, right? So if we're thinking about, for example, uh, Amazon warehouse workers who are being forced to work in really unsafe, um, you know, environments, they're, they're, they're working insane hours and, and they're actually, you know, being exposed to COVID-19. Here's a situation where we could say, well, let's actually support these workers, right? And, and, and they, they, they should be able to go on strike and we support them, right? To actually create a kind of safe environment for them to be working. Or if, if we think about, uh, you know, for example, Uber drivers, right? This, these, this idea of strike has to be at this moment used as a way to get demands that we want, right? So in the bill, right, uh, you know, there, there's actually, you know, your utilities can still be cut off. Your internet can still be cut off. There's really no real uh, protection for people um, who, who, I mean, yes, okay, you cannot pay your mortgage for a couple months. That's good, right? But if we're thinking about six months down the road, uh, we should be using the idea of the strike to actually uh, build in a stronger support and safety net for ourselves moving forward. And I think in actually doing that, we would really build a lot of solidarity uh, for, you know, thinking about a general strike in the long term, right? In a more kind of strategic, you know, imaginary, uh, you know, imagined kind of way. So I guess one last question that, I, that I'll get to is that um, someone uh, mentioned that there was some language around um, government equity, but not voting rights in um, one of the uh, bailout proposals. I think it was the airline bailout proposal, mm -hmm. um, which also got me thinking about, so one, does, is that actually a leverage point or is that just completely meaningless? Um, it seems like between that and between the claims that medium-sized companies can't um, have to be neutral in union elections. Uh, there's some like fake leaves here and there. Are any of those potential points of leverage or are they just you know, basically meaningless or symbolic? And I guess, what are our main mechanisms to force companies to um, actually productively invest when we don't have strong unions and we don't have centralized bargaining and 
it, it seems like our only avenue is the state. But even amid this crisis and with popular support, the state hasn't been able to have exerted any control over over uh, you know investment. Yeah, well, I mean, this question of you know equity and voting rights is interesting. Uh, in, in the in the auto bailout, bailout actually, uh, the Treasury, uh, for example, bought uh, equity in Chrysler, and then as soon as you know Chrysler was um, profitable again, promptly you know sold sold the shares back to the company. And so we're thinking, you know, it's not unprecedented for uh, the federal government to buy shares in companies, but it, there's always this kind of understanding. Uh, you know, either that they're not voting shares or that, you know, they, that it's, it's you know, the, that the federal government is not going to use these shares as a, you know, a way of, uh, you know, retaining ownership. And this is something that is really worth pushing on, right? If we're giving these companies billions of dollars uh, and we're thinking about, well, how do we actually build power for working people? You know, we should demand equity with voting rights, right? If we're giving airlines who have spent all of their money on share buybacks and, you know, and really enriched themselves at the expense of everyone else, well, that's ridiculous, right? We should say, if we won't give you any money unless you give us equity with voting rights, which will be distributed to either the people that work at these companies, right? Or, or thinking about sort of a broader kind of worker shareholder plan. I mean, this is something, yes, it seems like it's sort of a utopian demand, but you know, when we think about how do we actually build power, particularly to shape these very big, uh, these big companies, well, this is, a, this is one lever and, and a way to do that. So uh, once again, thank you so much for your time, Nicole. Thanks for everyone for tuning in. Uh, once again, we were talking with Nicole Ashoff, who is the author of most recently, uh, The Smartphone Society, and she's uh, also uh, regularly uh, writing for Jackman. She's on her site a couple times um, a week. And the last thing she wrote, I believe, was um, a piece just before the Senate bill um, was, was passed about what not to do in a relief bill. And it turned out that they just read her piece and did exactly <laughs> what Nicole uh, said not to do. But um, before everyone goes, I just wanted to also uh, mention just a few of the upcoming uh, broadcasts we're doing, uh, all of them at, at 6 p.m. Uh, so tomorrow, um, we will have Ronan Burtonshaw, who will be talking about the uh, formation of the British National Health Service, you know, one of the greatest triumphs of, of you know, really the organized uh, workers' movement, uh, period, I think far more staggering than, than you know, might seem from, from afar. Um, uh, then on Monday, we're taking Sunday off, but then on Monday at 6 p.m., we have Karen Orefsky, who's making the case for public housing, explaining you know, what actually functional ha public housing programs uh, have looked like internationally, uh, what they even look like in the United States when these programs are adequately funding and why, why they're such an important part of our, our demands around housing. We have Lee Phillips, on the uh, coronavirus and why free market capitalism, especially the level of drug production research, uh, cannot uh, keep up with, with this and, and future um, uh, viruses. Uh, Vijay Prashad uh, is on uh, Wednesday. He will be talking about the rise of Modi and the BJP. And you should definitely tune in with that one because I'm pretty sure Vijay is, is in India right now, which means that he's waking up at like 3 a.m. to do this. Um, and then the day after that, uh, Tony Wood uh, on Russia and the transition to capitalism is aftermath. Um, uh, we have a host of speakers for the for the rest of the the, the week too. Basically, every day um, at 6 p.m. you should tune in and tell your friends. And in the meantime, just subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, we spend uh, many months of the year asking you for support to keep Jackman going. Obviously, given the economic crisis and given I think the the Thing, issues that people are, are going through now. Uh, we just hope that uh, that everyone's back on their feet and able to help us in, in December when we do our next round of uh, fundraising. But um, in the meantime, uh, thank you, Nicole, and I hope everyone um, you know has a has a good rest of the night. Thanks, Busker. Thanks everyone for listening. <laughs>